Chapter Five of the Bird's Christmas Carol by Kate Douglas Wiggin. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Andrea Bolts. Chapter Five. Some other birds are taught to fly. Before the earliest Ruggles could wake and toot his five-cent tin horn, Mrs. Ruggles was up and stirring about the house, for it was a gala day in the family. Gala day! I should think so. Were not her nine children invited to a dinner party at the great house, and weren't they going to sit down free and equal with the mightiest in the land? She had been preparing for this grand occasion ever since the receipt of the invitation, which, by the way, had been speedily enshrined in an old photograph frame, and hung under the looking-glass in the most prominent place in the kitchen, where it stared the occasional visitor directly in the eye, and made him pale with envy. Bird's Nest December seventeenth, eighteen eighty. Dear Mrs. Ruggles, I am going to have a dinner party on Christmas Day, and would like to have all of your children come. I want them every one, please, from Sarah Maud to Baby Larry. Mama says dinner will be at half past five, and the Christmas tree at seven, so you may expect them home at nine o'clock. Wishing you a Merry Christmas and a Happy New Year, I am yours truly, Carol Bird. Breakfast was on the table promptly at seven o'clock, and there was very little of it, too, for it was an excellent day for short rations, though Mrs. Ruggles heaved a sigh as she reflected that even the boys, with their India-rubber stomachs, would be just as hungry the day after the dinner-party as if they had never had any at all. As soon as the scanty meal was over, she announced the plan of the campaign. Now, Susan— you and Kitty wash up the dishes, and Peter can't you spread up the beds, so t I can get to cuttin' out Larry's new suit. I ain't satisfied with his clothes, and I thought in the night of a way to make him a dress out of my old plaid shawl, kind of Scotch style, you know. You other boys clear out from underfoot. Clem, you and Con hop into bed with Larry while I wash your underflannins. T'won't take long to dry em. Sarah Maud, I think t'would be perfectly handsome if you ripped them brass buttons off your uncle's policeman's coat and sewed em in a row up the front of your green skirt. Susan, you must iron out yours and Kitty's aprons, and there, I came mighty near forgettin' Peory's stockings. I counted the whole lot last night when I was washin' of em, and there ain't but nineteen anyhow you fix em, and no nine pairs mates no how, and I ain't going to have my children wear odd stockings to a dinner company, brought up as I was. Eily, can't you run out and ask Miss Cullen to lend me a pair of stockings for Peory, and tell her if she will, Peory'll give Jim half her candy when she gets home, won't you, Peory? Peoria was young and greedy and thought the remedy so much worse than the disease that she set up a deafening howl at the projected bargain, a howl so rebellious and so out of all season that her mother started in her direction with flashing eye and uplifted hand. But she let it fall suddenly, saying, "'No, I won't lick your Christmas day if you drive me crazy, but speak up smart now and say whether you'd rather give Tim Cullen half your candy or go bare-legged to the party.' The matter being put so plainly, Peoria collected her faculties, dried her tears, and chose the lesser evil. Clem, having hastened the decision by an affectionate wink, that meant he'd go halves with her on his candy. "'That's a lady,' cried her mother. "'Now, you young ones that ain't doin' nothin', play all yer want to before noontime, for after you get through eatin' at twelve o'clock, me and Sarah Maud's going to give yer such a washin' and combin' and dressin' as you've never had before, and never will again, and then I'm going to set yer down and give you two solid hours trainin' in manners, and t'won't be no foolin' neither.' "'All we've got to do is go eat,' grumbled Peter. "'Well, that's enough.' responded his mother. There's more in one way of eatin', let me tell yer, and you've got a heap to learn about it, Peter Ruggles. Lord's sakes, I wish you children could see the way I was fetched up to eat. Never took a meal of vittles in the kitchen, before I married Ruggles, but you can't keep up that style with nine young ones and your pa always off to sea. The big Ruggleses worked so well, and the little Ruggleses kept from underfoot so successfully, that by one o'clock nine complete toilets were laid out in solemn grandeur on the beds. I say complete, but I do not know whether they would be called so in the best society. The law of compensation had been well applied. He that had necktie had no cuffs, she that had sash had no handkerchief, and vice versa, but they all had boots and a certain amount of clothing, such as it was, the outside layer being in every case quite above criticism. Now, Sarah Maud, said Mrs. Ruggles, her face shining with excitement, everything is read up and we can begin. 
I've got a boiler in a kettle and a pot of hot water. Peter, you go into the back bedroom, and I'll take Susan, Kitty, Peori, and Cornelius. And Sarah Maud, you take Clem and Eilie and Larry, one to a time, and get as far as you can with them, and then I'll finish them off while you do yourself. Sarah Maud couldn't have scrubbed with any more decision and force if she had been doing floors, and the little Ruggleses bore it bravely, not from natural heroism, but for the joy that was set before them. Not being satisfied, however, with the tone of their complexions, she wound up operations by applying a little bristol brick from the knife-board, which served as the proverbial last straw, from under which the little Ruggleses issued rather red and raw, and out of temper. When the clock struck three, they were all clothed, and most of them in their right minds, ready for those last touches that always take the most time. Kitty's red hair was curled in thirty-four ringlets, Sarah Maud's was braided in one pigtail, and Susan and Eilie's in two braids apiece, while Peoria's resisted all advances in the shape of hair oils, and stuck out straight on all sides, like that of the Circassian girl of the circus, so Clem said, and he was sent into the bedroom for it, too, from whence he was dragged out forgivingly by Peoria herself five minutes later. Then, exciting moment, came linen collars for some, and neckties and bows for others, and Eureka! The Ruggles were dressed, and Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. A row of seats was formed directly through the middle of the kitchen. There were not quite chairs enough for ten, since the family had rarely all wanted to sit down at once, somebody always being out or in bed, but the wood-box and the coal-hod finished out the line nicely. The children took their places according to age, Sarah Maud at the head, and Larry on the coal-hod, and Mrs. Ruggles seated herself in front, surveying them proudly as she wiped the sweat of honest toil from her brow. "'Well,' she exclaimed, "'if I do say so as I shouldn't, I never see a cleaner, more stylish mess of children in my life. I do wish Ruggles could look at you for a minute. Now I've often told you what kind of family the McGrills was.' I've got some reason to be proud. Your uncle is on the police force in New York City, and you can take up the newspaper most any day and see his name printed right out, James McGrill, and I can't have my children fetched up common like some folks. When they go out, they've got to have clothes and learn to act decent. Now I want to see how you're going to behave when you get there tonight. Let's start in the beginning and act out the whole business. Pile into the bedroom there, every last one of you, and show me how you're going to go into the parlor. "'This'll be the parlor, and I'll be Miss Bird.' The youngsters hustled into the next room in high glee, and Mrs. Ruggles drew herself up in her chair with an infinitely haughty and purse-proud expression that much better suited a descendant of the McGrills than modest Mrs. Bird. The bedroom was small, and there presently ensued such a clatter that you would have thought a herd of wild cattle had broken loose. The door opened, and they straggled in, all the little ones giggling, with Sarah Maud at the head, looking as if she had been caught in the act of stealing sheep, while Larry, being last in line, seemed to think the door a sort of gate of heaven which would be shut in his face if he didn't get there in time. Accordingly he struggled ahead of his elders, and disgraced himself by tumbling in head foremost. Mrs. Ruggles looked severe. There I knew you'd do it in some such fool way. Try it again, and if Larry can't come in on two legs he can stay to home. The matter began to assume a graver aspect. The little Ruggleses stopped giggling, and backed into the bedroom, issuing presently with lockstep, Indian file, a scared and hunted expression in every countenance. "'No, no, no!' cried Mrs. Ruggles in despair. "'You look for all the world like a gang of prisoners. There ain't no style to that. Spread out more, can't you? And act kind of careless-like. Nobody's going to kill you.' The third time brought deserved success, and the pupils took their seats in the row. "'Now you know,' said Mrs. Ruggles, "'there ain't enough decent hats to go round, and if there was I don't knows I'd let you wear em, for the boys would never think to take em off when they got inside. But anyhow there ain't enough good ones. Now look me in the eye. You needn't wear no hats, none of you, and when you get into the parlour and they ask you to lay off your hats, Sarah Maud must speak up and say it was such a pleasant evening, and such a short walk, that you left your hats to home to save trouble. Now can you remember?' All the little Ruggleses shouted, "'Yes, ma'am,' in chorus. "'What have you got to do with it?' demanded their mother. "'Did I tell you to say it? Wasn't I talking to Sarah Maud?' The little Ruggleses hung their diminished heads. "'Yes, ma'am,' they piped more feebly. "'Now get up, all of you, and try it. 
Speak up, Sarah Maud. Sarah Maud's tongue clove to the roof of her mouth. Quick! Ma thought it was such a pleasant hat that we'd, we'd better leave our short walk to home, recited Sarah Maud in an agony of mental effort. This was too much for the boys. Oh, whatever shall I do with you, moaned the unhappy mother. I suppose I've got to learn it to you which she did, word for word, until Sarah Maud thought she could stand on her head and say it backwards. Now, Cornelius, what are you going to say to make yourself good company? Dunno, said Cornelius, turning pale. Well, you ain't going to sit there like a bump on a log without saying a word to pay for your vittles, are you? Ask Miss Bird how she's feeling this evening, or if Mr. Bird's having a busy season or something like that. Now we'll make believe we've got to the dinner. That won't be so hard, cause you'll have something to do. It's awful bothersome to stand round and act stylish. If they have napkins, Sarah Maud down to Peori may put em in their laps, and the rest of you can tuck em into your necks. Don't eat with your fingers. Don't grab no vittles off one another's plates. Don't reach out for nothing but wait till you're asked, and if you never get asked, don't get up and grab it. Don't spill nothing on the tablecloth, or likes not Miss Bird'll send you away from the table. Now we'll try a few things to see how they go. Mr. Clement, do ye eat cranberry sauce? Bet your life! cried Clem, who, not having taken in the idea exactly, had mistaken this for an ordinary family question. "'Clement Ruggles, do you mean to tell me that you'd say that to a dinner party? I'll give you one more chance, Mr. Clement. Will you take some of the cranberry?' "'Yes, marm, thank you kindly, if you happen to have any handy.' "'Very good indeed. Mr. Peter, do you speak for white or dark meat?' "'I ain't particular as to colour. Anything that nobody else wants will suit me.' answered Peter with his best air. First rate! Nobody could speak more genteel than that. Miss Kitty, will you have hard or soft sars with your puddin? A little of both, if you please, and I'm much obliged, said Kitty with decided ease and grace, at which all the other Ruggleses pointed the finger of shame at her, and Peter grunted expressively that their meaning might not be mistaken. You just stop your gruntin', Peter Ruggles. That was all right. I wish I could get it into your heads that it ain't so much what you say as the way you say it. Either you and Larry's too little to train, so you just look at the rest and do as they do, and the Lord have mercy on you and help you to act decent. Now is there anything more you'd like to practice? If you tell me one more thing I can't set up and eat, said Peter gloomily. I'm so cram full of manners now I'm ready to burst out no dinner at all. Me too! chimed Cornelius. Well, I'm sorry for you both, rejoined Mrs. Ruggles sarcastically. If the amount of manners you've got on hand now troubles you, you're dreadful easy hurt. Now, Sarah Maud, after dinner, about once in so often, you must say, I guess we'd better be going. And if they say, oh no, set a while longer, you can stay. But if they don't say nothing, you've got to get up and go. Can you remember? About once in so often. Could any words in the language be fraught with more terrible and wearing uncertainty? Well, answered Sarah Maud mournfully, seems as if this whole dinner party sat right square on top of me. Maybe I could manage my own manners, but to manage nine manners is as worse than staying to home. Oh, don't fret, said her mother good-naturedly. I guess you'll get along. I wouldn't mind if folks would only say, Oh, children will be children, but they won't. They'll say, Land o' goodness, who fetched them children up? Now it's quarter past five. You can go, and whatever you do, don't forget your mother was a McGrill. End of chapter five.